Thank you, Steve. It's great to come back to College Park and, and visit Steve, uh, my, my former thesis advisor. Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I guess I graduated from UD Austin 25 years ago, in the same year you moved here. So now, uh, you know, it's another 25 years since then uh, from the time I graduated. So uh, it's great to come back, keep coming back. And uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about control software and some of the work that we have done for um, testing. And, and this will sound very familiar to Rancy has a company which does software testing. So uh, we all know that uh, control software, uh, one of the way to implement control software is Simulink and state flow. And uh, turns out, you know, software faults is is one of the biggest reasons that that we have field calls, and so it's clear that we need uh, enhanced ways of making sure the software is correct. Uh, which, for example, doing formal verification testing, and also uh, even after that, software may still have faults, and so uh, runtime monitoring. So while so so do the analysis in the design phase as well as in runtime. So, uh, so the goal of this talk is to think about a model-based approach for safety analysis of embedded software. So I'm going to first talk about the design time error analysis and in that, uh, how to do the modeling, how to do the test generation, how to do the validation and localization. And then I'm going to talk about the runtime. So uh, let's start with this simple example. So uh, what we have is a, is a motor uh, shown in the top right. The, the laser pointer doesn't really work. Oh, okay. So okay. Kind of yeah, so, you could, so, there, so this is a cyber physical system, simple system where a motor is being controlled by a, a software which is residing on a microcontroller. And then there's also a monitor which m monitors various input-output signals to determine if there is a fault or not. So uh, the control software itself receives input from the user, uh, which, would, which, would, which would be a, a sequence of set point velocities for the motor, as well as start and stop commands. And then it's going to output to the motor uh, the translated version of those commands. And, and then the controller has to make sure that some of the properties are satisfied. So for example, whenever the user presses the stop, then the motor actually halts in the next four steps, uh, which is the four clock ticks of the, of, uh, at the rate at which the system is operating. And then, uh, then there is another specification like that. So uh, such a system uh, can be modeled uh, using Simlink state flow. So uh, this, is, uh, this is the, f the, the model for the, the entire system. If you zoom in here, you'll see the model of the motor. If you zoom in here, you'll see the model of certain fault monitors that I was talking about. So let me do that. So that's, uh, for example, showing the Simlink version of the model of the, of the plant and the controller. And then uh, if you zoom in there, uh, we see the models in state flow. So this model is model of the control software itself. Then there are certain uh, state flow models of what, what are the fault monitors. And the fault monitors could be monitoring the behavior of the software or the, entire, or the system as a whole. So the uh, question uh, is that, that one needs to answer is, uh, so that control software that's going to run on a microprocessor is not going to be a simulink diagram. It's going to be an object code. question is, can we use the fact that that code is generated from this source, which is a simulink state flow diagram, and, and generate test vectors so that we can test the code? And we want to do this with, with uh, making sure that uh, all the competitions are covered. So here is the 
approach. Um, we would start from a symlink state flow diagram, uh, convert that into an, uh, a model, which which is an automata model, and and in that it will become clear what computations are possible at each time step. So when when we go around the loop, uh, that's that's one computation at a time step. So the in, in a discrete time setting. Um, time is discrete, the inputs are, are sampled at each sample point, and that's where the outputs are computed. And so when that happens, uh, that computation would produce one of these paths. Um, so uh, let's talk about the model translation first, and how do we do it. Uh, so uh, the uh, a Simulink state flow diagram, so this is for Simulink, is made by taking some atomic blocks such as summation, uh, a constant input, a delay, and then putting them together. So the, the way this is modeled is uh, for each atomic block that is shown there, we model with it, it uh, using a pair of automata. Um, and, and so for example, this blue block uh, has this pair of automata for its model, and that green block has, you know, this pair. So every atomic block is modeled by a, a, a pair of automata, and, and not just a pair. Each pair has basically two locations. I'm so, sorry. excuse me, one second. What does EFA mean? Extended finite automata. So, uh, so input output extended finite automata. Finite automata. It does not have uh, variables, so extended finite would have a variable. Uh, then we need to augment. So, for example, in this setting, um, this um, this is a subsystem which is enabled uh, whenever the input is one, and so there is uh, uh, we can automatically augment this set of blocks with uh, a block which corresponds to that conditioning. And then uh, we have to introduce succession edges be between these individual blocks. And that, uh, that's going to be uh, decided from the execution order. So when, when this uh, Simulink diagram computes, uh, each of these blocks are executed in a certain uh, order. That's, that's, how, that's, that's within MATLAB. So we'll follow the same order. And then we'll also add an, a, a time advancement edge. So here, uh, the time counter k goes from k to k plus 1. So as, as uh, an input is received, uh, one of these loops will be executed. And at the end of the loop, the time counter will advance by one step. When the next input is received, this, another loop will be executed. But this captures all the loops that the system can execute. What about for state flow? Uh, so here is a state flow system. And if, we, if you zoom in, that's how the state flow looks like. Uh, basically, there is a, a state flow is a hierarchical state machine. So uh, there is a hierarchy embedded in there. So there is something called a root state. And then within that, you have uh, uh, substates. So this whole root state has data update and output assignment as two substate. And each of them have their own substates. So in this, and, and then uh, the substates could be an AND substate or an OR substate. So AND substate would mean uh, when that state is active, both the substates are active. And OR means when that state is active, uh, the children, one of them is active. Right, so it's either an AND child or an R child. So uh, we, uh, we're going to model each state and substate uh, using a canonical three, three location input output extended finite automata. So here is that uh, model. So, each, so for, for each state in the hierarchy, you have a model. And, and all of them have same structure, there are three locations and three transitions. What differs is, of course, the computations that happens on those edges. And, and those correspond to the computation 
when the state is entered, uh, when the state is maintained. So there is a notion of entry competition, during competition, and exit com competition. So those are captured. And depending on uh, whether uh, a substate is an AND substate or an R substate, uh, we will connect them. And this is also automatically done. So that connectivity comes from the, f from the fact that it's, it's an AND child or an R child. Then there is also, uh, in, in state flow, there is other uh, construct which allows e event broadcasts. So for example, when this transition is executed, uh, uh, data update dot count is enabled. So this transition has that label. And so data update is this particular and count is the transition. So the count transition of the data update block execute. execute. So after, as soon as this transition is taken, actually the control is passed to that state and the competition shifts. So it's like a go-to statement. And, and so we can propagate that by you know, making some edge movements which is basically transfer of control of computation. So that's the, uh, then, then you end up with the automata model of the, of the state flow. So I should, I should mention that you know, um, yeah, the, the idea here is to preserve the input-output computation at the sampling points. Um, so, so although uh, in a Simulink block the time could be continuous, uh, it has a discrete time semantic. The inputs and outputs are only looked at at the sample points. And this automata only will tell you the inputs and outputs at the sample points. It won't tell you at the intermediate points. So it's, it's, in, the, in the end, it's an it's a extended finite automata. It's not a hybrid automata because there are no flows here. Yeah? Um, so does your model capture the dynamics as simulating? Simulate? Yeah. So for example, um, I have encountered situations where if I am trying to do um, a feedback, output feedback, and or use the state from the integrator back to some form of an input to the integrator, then the order of execution matters. I cannot directly take the output and then feed it back as part of the input to the integrator. Whereas I think MATLAB has to do a conflict resolution to first initialize what the state is. And because the output is not calculated unless you give all the inputs, that sort of a loop cannot be executed. So does your model also capture? Yeah, so yeah, so there, within a MATLAB or Simulink, uh, there is something called uh, execution order. So if you click on the diagram, uh, you can figure out in what order these blocks are going to be executed. So, uh, so we, we follow the same succession order. So it's, it's borrowed exactly. So, so we want to preserve that semantics, so it's it borrowed exactly from there. So all the competitions in MATLAB are deterministic. Right? So there is an order. And so this, uh, uh, yeah, so that, preserve, that ordering is preserved here. It's actually borrowed from MATLAB. The situation you're talking about is sometimes called an algebraic loop also. Yes. Sometimes the algebraic loops are allowed, sometimes they're not. Yeah. Um, if the yeah, block scheduler can figure out a reasonable order that it allows it, otherwise it okay. sometimes will reject it too. Okay. So, so now, uh, uh, so we have built this tool which will take as input uh, simulating state flow and, and spit out uh, the extended automata model. Uh, so this is showing a demo of that tool. So, uh, so you would start with the, uh, the system that you have in mind and tell the tool uh, which are the input ports and the output ports. And, and, and from there, it'll go ahead. Uh, and you have to also tell what is the sampling rate. Uh, and then it'll automatically generate the corresponding automata model. And since that automata model uh, is essentially a state flow block, the translated model in our case is also a MATLAB object. So um, after translation, what you get is can itself be simulated in MATLAB. So, so the, I, the EFAs then are just MATLAB, MATLAB code? Yeah, so that's, that's shown here. In fact, this is that translated model. And it can be simulated in the MATLAB uh, 
the way the simulink diagram can be simulated and, and one can actually run this simulation of both the source uh, simulink diagram and, and the target translated model in MATLAB and, and visually compare the input-output computations so, uh, and, and see if they match or not. So in this case, obviously they do. Uh, so this is the translated model for the, the motor example that I had shown. Uh, and so it, it has many of these locations and those transitions as it executes. I see. So you're actually translating the, you're flattening the, uh, yeah. generating kind of a flat uh, yes. state flow model. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so s state flow becomes flat and, and simulink gets translated to also flat automata model. Yeah. So, uh, so that's the model translation. Uh, once, once we have done that, then from that, it's very clear uh, that you know what kind of computations this model can do. Uh, each computation is basically a run from the initial location back to that same initial location. So that initial location is also the final location. And so by enumerating all the loops, we can figure out all the possible computations that can happen under different input condition. Uh, or different sequence of input conditions. So for example, this, this, uh, has, uh, this example had, has a total of 18 paths. So there are, uh, there are two branches there. There are three here. Uh, and act, yeah, so there are three branches initially. There are three branches here and two here. So three times three times two, that's total 18 different paths. So I'm, I'm looking at path 17, which has a sequence of edges. Each edge has a, a, a guard condition. For example, it says input has to be less than zero, and then it will set output to, to equal to two. Um, so uh, each edge has uh, a sequence of edge and corresponds to a certain behavior there. So for example, this E2 followed by E8 corresponds to receiving an input zero, which disables this subsystem and then pro provides a default output of two. Uh, the next pair of edges have, you know, so there is a saturation block there, which saturates if the if the input to the block is um, up higher than seven. But since the, the there is no saturation here, the output is is same as two. Um, and so uh, the next transition is actually uh, resetting this this delay. So this has uh, this is a delay block has one bit of memory and when whenever the input is zero that's reset and then and finally the last thing is done is to advance the time so uh, by once we have this translated model we can know that in this example uh, for, for example uh, the there are 18 possible control type computations that system can execute at any given sample time. So it's, it's really a concatenation of one of these 18 competitions that, that is seen in, in practice. So these EFAs have the same, you don't have any loops except ones that start and end yeah. in the initial state? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it keeps it simple. I mean, so, yeah, so but, but since you, at each time instance you have 18 choices, so it's really, uh, you know, uh, so if, if it's an alphabet, sigma, uh, alphabet of 18 elements, and it's really a con concatenation of, at any instant, one of these 18 elements will be executed, depending on, of course, uh, what input sequence has been applied and what was the initial condition. So, uh, so there are some memory elements like delay block has an initial value. So depending on how many um, delay blocks that are there, you'll have that initial condition. So the dynamics will depend on the initial condition and the sequence of inputs. So the next thing uh, we, would, we would do is, is although there are 18 paths, uh, some of them may not be even executable because of the guard conditions. And that's easy to verify is, is for, for each path, computation path, uh, you can compute the path predicate, which is basically, uh, which, which says that under this guard condition, 
and that's the output that is being computed. So it's P implies Q, P is the precondition and Q is the output. So for each edge you have a, a guard implies the, the uh, reset uh, and then you take the conjunction over all edges and if that uh, is feasible then of course that, it, it's, that, that may be a feasible path. If you look at another edge, this is a path predicate for path 16, uh, which basically changes uh, this edge worse to that edge, and then that's not feasible because those constraints cannot be satisfied. So feasibility uh, is, is looking at the conditions with the edges. It's not looking at the condition associated with the entry, which is the initial state. So, uh, so, uh, so one has to also worry about that. But just from feasibility point of view, uh, out of 18 points, 18 paths, it turns out only five are feasible. Um, so in a, in a real execution, so, f so for these five paths, uh, it's possible that there is an initial condition which will make them execute. But we don't know that yet. But we certainly know that, that the ones that are infeasible, there's no initial condition which will make them execute. So that's, uh, finding the initial condition is a harder problem. That's the reachability problem. Um, so, uh, so, the, so one can do that in, in different ways. Uh, so uh, one is based on model checking. So the idea would then be to automatically translate the IOEFA model to a model checker such as new SMV. So we have written that tool as well. Um, and, then, um, and then encode the execution, the possibility of execution of a computation path at some future computation, not that at initial computation, uh, as an eventuality property in, in the CTL, uh, in the temporal logic. So for example, uh, this is the CTL formula that encodes that this path 17 is executed eventually. So it says exist a competition says that in future this succession of edges that appear in, in path 17 are executed. So EF is ev exist a competition such that something happens in future and EX is exist a competition so that something happens in the next step. Um, uh, I'm sorry, the X here is interpreted with respect to the EFA, not with respect to the uh, yeah. Model. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So, yeah, with respect to this model itself, and and so we want to know does there exist? A, so we want we encode a negation of that property. So we we ask the the model checker is asked, uh, is there no computation which will execute this sequence of edges eventually? And if there is a computation, then that will come out as a come out as a counterexample to this question, and and through that. Uh, country example will also get a test case. So it turns out that out of 18 computations, um, uh, the ones, the four of them is, is reachable. One of them, which, which was feasible, is no longer reachable. So only, only f uh, four of these computations have the property that system will start from an initial condition and eventually through other computation, it will get executed. Um, so that's based on model checking. Uh, we have another approach which converts the test generation prob problem to a hybrid automata reachability problem. Uh, and that's done by, you know, uh, first going through the computations that I talked about earlier to find which f five of these 18 are feasible. And then uh, build an automata, this is a discrete time hybrid automata where each node is one of these feasible paths. And then uh, the, the idea is that, that you know, uh, it will start from any of uh, the initial computations for which, which are enabled at time zero because of the initial condition uh, uh, that is given. And, and then, um, then you know, this, this computation can run for finite number of times, 
and then it can shift. Some other competition can run a finite number of times. Some other. So in a hybrid automata, uh, if you are in a location, the competition flows for a, for a time and then switches to the next one. So the only difference here is that the, the competitions within a location is a, is a discrete time competition. So it's a difference equation as opposed to a differential equation. But uh, so question, you know, uh, so question really boils down to whether a certain path. Uh, so if a, if a path ha can can be executed, so that you can have a test case for it, then it has to be reachable in this discrete time hybrid automaton. So uh, generating a test is boils down to uh, a reachability problem, <laughs> and that can that's an in general an undecidable problem for for uh, when when for real valued case, but. We can uh, resolve reachability. We have a, a, a state space refinement algorithm so that it goes through uh, steps. I, I won't go into detail, but uh, in the end, uh, it'll st start with a structure like this and we'll end up with a structure with the property that each location has a unique successor. So here, this location has three successor. It gets refined in, in, in the first iteration in, and, and get split into three sublocations, and each one have its own unique successor. And in the next step, this location, which has three successors, gets refined. And, and then, uh, so after one has gone through this step, uh, we'll end up with a discrete time hybrid automata, which has the same behavior, but with the property that each location has a unique successor. And, and in this case, reachability. Uh, uh, of the discrete time automata is equivalent to the reachability of the uh, of the discrete system, where you ignore all the uh, so the reachability of the graph is same as the reachability of the hybrid automata, and through that you can generate the test. And here is the application. So, so if uh, but this requires that uh, that one should be able to solve these difference equation analytically. So in, in, for example, here, uh, in order to reach this, uh, this data has to be bigger than 10,000 or 100,000. And, and actually, the initial value of the data is zero. So the, there is a counter which has to count 100,000 times before you can actually reach this. Uh, but 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 solving this equation is very easy. So you can symbolically solve this equation and compute the test case uh, for that. Uh, and and so uh, in this case, actually, if you're using um, so so if this works, you don't really need an upper bound uh, on a, a priori upper bound on deciding the reachability. So finally, uh, once we have generated all the test cases, uh, we can do the validation. So for example, um, we found that four out of 18 paths are testable. And, and these are the test sequence. So path five, in order to execute path five, you have to apply this sequence of input outputs. We apply that sequence of input, and you observe the corresponding sequence of outputs. And, and in the last step, path five will be executed. So path five isn't executed immediately. Some other paths are executed, and eventually path five is executed. So that sort of loads up the state so yeah. that path five becomes feasible. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So you have to you have to prepare the state. Yeah, you have to prepare this state. So in each iteration, that state is also being modified. D is being modified. Um, so now, now suppose I have a requirement which says uh, when input is zero, output is zero, um, and then if you look at these test vectors, then certainly that requirement is violated. So uh, we know that there is some error in this computation, and we also now know that the error is associated with path 17. Uh, if you zoom into path 17, that corresponds to the sequence of edges. So, and each, as, as we saw, uh, each edge has its own, represents a certain behavior. So if a fault is detected, it could be in any one of these edges. 
Uh, and so, uh, so we can actually do some analysis to figure out that it turns out that although the requirement is violated for that particular test, it turns out that whenever the edge E2 together with edge 13 is executed, this pair, uh, then regardless of what else is executed, there is a fault. So, the, so that's the, the real culprit or the root cause is, is really this edge edges. The other edges don't cause any problem. So uh, finding the root cause can be uh, actually also posed as a model checking problem. So uh, one can construct an automaton so, uh, uh, paired with this faulty computation and look at fragments of that faulty computation and see if this property satisfied is basically saying that whenever that fragment is executed, then regardless of what else is executed, the fault will be witnessed. Um, so, uh, so that's so that's fault localization, and and so we found, for example, that fault is located in in those two computations, and those two computations corresponds to something in the simulink diagram. That mapping can be done automatically. So now the the user or designer can be told that you know there is some requirement violation. Uh, you should look into the, these parameters of your system. Uh, that's where the error is most likely located. Another source of error could be when a certain edge is never executed. So, for example, uh, in, in all these feasible paths, the edge 11 is never executed. So the edge 11 can be mapped to something else in the Simulink block. And, and that's say, that is the saturation block corresponding to a lower threshold of minus 0.5. In this case, that will never be visited, so that could be another uh, design error, and the designer can be told to look into that. Is that a design error or just a sort of extra thing that doesn't work? Well, yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah, well, so. Uh, I mean, does it actually affect system performance, or is it just something extra that? Yeah, it, it, it could be something extra, but, but then that could, you know, if you build something else later, uh, you know, this something extra may actually have, have start to, so that happens all the time. Uh, the, there are unintended consequences of something extra yeah. that happens. Is it, also actually, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. is it also possible that a, a bit flip in the computer or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In that state, yeah. And then you're yeah, so a bit flip is, is not a design error. It's most, more of an implementation error. So yeah, the designer may have designed the Simulink diagram. Everything is OK. But the code generator may have introduced an error. And, and that's, that happens all the time as well. We don't know that the compilers are correct. So you have to still test the code, although the design may be correct. And, and even in the design, you know, um, certainly somebody may type 0 0.1 as, as 0 1.0 or something like that. <laughs> and, and that can lead to, you know, and it's, it's, it discrete systems don't have the continuity property. A small change yeah. in, a, in a variable doesn't necessarily translate to a small change in the competition. Yeah, the other point I was going to make is that from a practical perspective, if you look at the generated code for that saturation block, if you never if you never exercise the branch associated with negative 0.5, there's sort of dead code. Yeah. And the regulators don't like that, especially the FAA. Yeah. You, you uh, have to certify that your anything that flies on the airplane, for instance, does not have any free of dead code. Because it's, they, they view this as evidence of yeah either of some thinking that was not precise enough during the implementation process. Yeah, so thanks. So yeah, so we have uh, a tool for doing the model translation and the other tool which takes that translated model and goes through these steps to, uh, to automatically compute the test cases. And, and it'll do that to the extent it's, it's doable. Of course, it's in general an undecidable problem. Uh, but if, if, uh, if it can be done, then, then, then there will be at least one test case for each possible computation and giving you a complete uh, computation coverage. Um, how much time do I have? Should I? So 
11 or so. So 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the, the second thing uh, that one can analyze in design time is the robustness uh, of the coverage of the test that we have generated through this approach uh, corresponding to the platform imperfections. So, uh, uh, so uh, you know, when, when these computations happen, there can be numerical error. Uh, so, the, so there is accuracy to which the summing junction can add. Uh, there are also computation delays that Simulink introduces. Um, so, uh, and then when the input is, you know, this is a control system, it receives an input from somewhere else. Um, that input itself uh, would have some numerical error. And, and so because of the finite precision arithmetic and because of uh, uh, delays, non-zero delays, the, the semantics of the code is not necessarily the same as the semantics of the simulating state flow. So, uh, and that, er that errors can accumulate, and, and if you execute a test in the simulating diagram, it may run a, a certain path there, but in the code, it may end up running another path. So you, you, you may not have guarantees of coverage anymore. So, uh, so we, we can, but we can, uh, track, so by introducing new state variables, so for each variable we can introduce an error variable. And the error variable is going to have its own dynamics. Uh, and so this, for example, shows the dynamics of the error variables for different, under different computation possibly. Uh, and then uh, the, you can also introduce a delay variable which will have its own dynamics. And, and the, uh, the good thing about it is all that can be captured in the same structure. So we are not changing the structure, all we are changing is adding more variables and, and tracking their evolution. Um, so that's the, the implementation model versus the design model. So the implementation model, so implementation model is going to be a little more relaxed. It's going to have more behaviors uh, because of the error. So uh, for the robustness uh, of the test, we would want to make sure that when you apply, for example, an input which uh, activates a path uh, in the design model, then the same path is executed in the uh, implementation model. So here is that implementation model. And it turns out, because of that relaxation, um, the, that same input ends up executing more than one path. So path robustness is not sat satisfied under this kind of implementation. Uh, and, and again, uh, checking whether an implementation would allow path robustness to be preserved can be cast as a reachability problem. So, uh, so far so good. Uh, we have looked at you know, a few, few ways to look at a, a software from correctness point of view in design time. And, and, and hopefully remove lots of errors, but some of them may still survive. It's an undecidable problem. Uh, and so, so it's good to also do the same uh, monitoring as the code is executing. Uh, so let's look at, uh, so we could monitor the, the evolution of the software against its requirements, or we can monitor the evolution of the software together with the hardware and, and the plant and, and against the, the requirements of the system as a whole. So to monitor, for example, a software, uh, one would build an automata. So here is the temporal logic encoding of one of the properties of the control software, which says that uh, whenever a stop is pressed in the next four steps, the motor should be halted. Well, that can be captured. So that temporal logic formula can be cross, uh, translated to an extended finite automata. Uh, and, and it will have, so the, 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 the edges will be labeled by predicates that appear here. So uh, for example, there's a predicate servo disable and predicate stop. So that's phi1 and phi2. So basically, uh, those two predicates and their Boolean combinations appear as guard conditions for this uh, automata. And then we also add an extra state, which is reached, uh, which when reached corresponds to violation of that property. 
So, uh, so here is a, uh, for example, runtime monitoring situation. Uh, here, what we're looking at um, the evolution of the control software. So each transition represents receiving an input, processing it, and producing an output. And then uh, there are monitors for monitoring. So this is, for example, the that monitor uh, that property that I showed in the previous slide. This is another property of the software. Then system has its own properties. So what has happened in this case is the system monitor has already reached a fault state, which means some system level property is has been violated under under this sequence of arrival of inputs. So there is an input to the for one port and there is another input to the other port. So we've detected at this point uh, a property violation of the system. Well, that could be uh, an error in the plant or in the software or in the hardware, so computing hardware, because the software monitor hasn't detected any fault yet. Um, so, um, so we just move back to it's moving back and forth between that fault state and the other state as we're watching. So no, the false state, once you reach a false state, you will stay there. But it looked uh, like it, well, okay. And it's repeating itself. It's repeating. It's just okay. blinking because, uh, okay. so each time step, it, it does a blink. Okay. Yeah. So that, these are not moving. Uh, those may be moving. Yeah. So, uh, so if, if a software, mon software monitor is, um, is basically tracking a deterministic evolution, uh, because uh, the input-output computations of a software are, are generally deterministic. I mean, there could be some randomness if the hardware has some bit, you know, if the sh one of the hardware register flips. What about the errors? Huh? What about the errors? You had that, those error bounds. Those are normally interpreted as probabilistic. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, so, so that... Yes, okay, good point. Yeah, we could, we could think of that errors as either deterministic or probabilistic. So error bounds is a range, so you can, in, in, you can treat it, like in robust control, you can treat it. That was a question I was going to ask before, that um, you have error bounds, and, and, but the errors themselves can be anywhere inside the bounds, so those are real numbers. Mm -hmm. But you really want, need to replace them by uh, discrete values, is that right? No, you... Well, so you, you want to do a worst case analysis, regardless of whatever error happens within that range, your computation is correct. So it's a, it's a worst case analysis you know, as opposed to average case analysis. How do you know the worst case is, is at the boundaries of the error? No, no, so, so any, it's not necessarily boundaries anywhere in that range. The worst case, you know, so you, you want to make sure that if the error is anywhere in that interval, the robustness property is satisfied, the one that I was talking about. Well, uh, but if you're monitoring the behavior of, a, of the whole control system, then the physical side of it has randomness because the, the sensors and actuators have randomness. So then the monitors are not going to be deterministic. Um, so, here is, uh, so here is a monitor, for example, of a plant and, and system specification combined. So again, in this monitor, you have a false state. And, and, and now, because uh, we are modeling the plant and we have a discrete time semantics in mind, the model now is actually a, a hybrid automata, uh, but the flows in each location is, is, is a discrete time flow. So uh, at each time instant, uh, one can determine the, the conditional distribution of the state in that location given the history of inputs and outputs. So in fact, there is a pair of distribution, one before the input is, input output is processed, one after. So that's the, the Kalman, extended Kalman type filtering. And those could then be combined to get the probability distributions of the locations itself. So that's going to be a probability mass function as opposed to PDF. Uh, and these are the filtering equations which can be used to compute that. And, and once we find that the, the probability of reaching the fault location exceeds a certain threshold, uh, 
then we can declare a fault. So uh, in, in case of um, model where you have probabilistic behavior, we can only declare a fault with certain probability. So there's always a, a decision statistic and a decision threshold. That decision statistic will be compared with the threshold to make a decision about fault or no fault. So, uh, so, so we can then introduce a notion of detectability, and this is r really uh, a generalization of something that was introduced in discrete event system uh, for finite automata. So the idea there is that whenever a system fault is, system executes a fault, then within bounded evolution, the probability of the the probability the, the probability estimate of that fault must rise above a certain decision threshold with, with very high probability. So uh, if that property is satisfied, then the fault can be detected. Right? So, so here is uh, a picture. So suppose system executes a run, and, and that, that, ha that witnesses a f some kind of violation of a property. Then uh, there exists a, a bounded evolution so that regardless of what evolution happens, uh, so in some cases, the, the, the fault statistics will be below that threshold. In some cases, it will be higher than threshold. So here, we can detect fault. There, we will miss it. But the, the, the cases where we can detect fault occurs with a, a probability higher than uh, some value. The value of the evolution has to be uniform then. Yeah, that's the detectability property definition. And that can be captured. So, uh, so for, for any, um, yeah. So for any tau and rho, there exists a delay. So, with, so that this, this is true. And so uh, there will be cases where the fault will be missed. So those will be those extensions where the threshold is not reached. Those are the probability of false negative. There is probability of false, false positive as well. And, and then, um, then we can show that um, as long as, so detectability, this definition here becomes a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of a detector which can um, detect fault with ev any given, uh, with, with desired false negative and false positive rates. So if, if false positive and negative rates alpha and beta are specified, I can find a d detector with a certain delay bound, which will guarantee that the false negatives are below rate alpha and false positives are below rate beta. And that's true if and only if this property is satisfied the, by the system. So it's really an extension of uh, detectability that was introduced in discrete event systems. Um, so as I said, if a fault is detected at the software monitor, we immediately know that uh, the software has a bug in it. If it is detected at a system monitor, then we still need to figure out the faulty component. And, and so, we can do these kinds of analysis. So uh, to know if the CPU or the communication bus had an error, we can repeat a computation. And if that repetition, um, to, 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 to know whether there was probably a transient fault or not. If there is a permanent fault, then that can be detected by running a uh, diagnostic test for the CPU. So there's, there's generally there is a built-in self-test for testing hardware, and that can be used. Uh, and to know if there is any, if the plant itself had an error, one can generate the residue. Um, so having a, an observer which tracks the plant, and, and if the plant, you know, if something in the plant broke, the, the leak started, then the, the dynamics of the plant will change from the model dynamics. And the output of the plant versus the output of the model will have an error. And that error will have a non-zero expected value. Uh, so that, so we can eliminate plant faults, hardware faults, and then and know that this is a software fault. So once the software fault is identified, uh, 
then the error can again be lo localized using the, the fault seed, the root, root cause analysis that I talked about. Well, uh, so this with this, I would like to end my talk. Uh, these are some of the former students who have participated in the project. Shengbing is with uh, GM. Uh, Mong is at GE and Jun, who did the work on stochastic hybrid automata, the fault detectability, he is at Idaho National Lab. And Chang Yan did some of the model translation work. Uh, she is at Magnetech. That's my talk for today. Thank you. Thanks.